investors, and welcome to my YouTube channel, where I study the best investors and businesses from around the world. Today, we will be looking at Manish Pabrai's advice on compounding with the spawners. Warning, this is a long video that takes almost two hours to complete, but I have summarized the key points here for you, and if you would like to watch the full video, I will drop in the link in the comment section so that you can have access to it. In my video series, I'll break this up into three parts. Part number one will cover the difference between growing pies and discounted pies. Part number two will cover the five ways that you could get 10 to 100 times baggers. Part number three will cover the different spawner types. So without taking much time, let's move straight to the video. Enjoy. So if you are an investor, a value investor really at the highest level, you've got kind of two kinds of options in terms of businesses that you can invest in. Number one, you can invest in what he calls growing pies. These are businesses which have strong growth ahead of them. They've got long runways and the business can get pretty large. You can do quite well investing in growing pies, even if one is paying what might appear to be an expensive price. There are many advantages to being an investor in growing pies. You can set it and forget it. You can get 10 to 100 times bagger possibilities. This is really one of the only ways that you can really get to really strong multi-bagger returns, maybe 10 times or 100 times your money. So growing pies is definitely a great way to go. Number two, the second way to invest is discounted pies. Here you are on a treadmill of activity because you will have to be buying and selling and then again buy and again sell and keep doing that. In taxable accounts, it can be tax inefficient. It's difficult to get more than double or triple returns because if you bought a company at 50% off and it did not grow and you were correct about it, then maybe you would double your money and when that valuation gap closes and maybe even if it gets some growth, you might get three times your money or something, but it, it's hard to get more than that. When Manish started as an investor in 1994, having just heard about Buffett, he was focused on growing pies and the period from 1994 to about 1999 or 2000 was a period of very strong stock market returns in the US. This eventually peaked with a very massive bubble, the tech bubble of 2000 and then of course the Nasdaq index crashed and burned. It dropped about 80% and even the S&P had a very long period of no returns. In 1998 or 1999, Manish Pabrai saw that things were getting frothy and in this time he had done really well. In fact, he captured 200 baggers at that period. He was an individual investor at the time, so was not running a fund, but then he was concerned around the late 1999, mid-1999, that party at some point will end and it will probably end badly. The market was very interesting at that time because there were a set of companies that were very overvalued and there was another whole set of businesses which were not sexy businesses which were very modestly priced and even maybe severely underpriced and so one could make investments in those businesses. For example, in 2000, the day the Nasdaq peaked, Around March 6th or March 9th, 2000, was the same day that Berkshire Hathaway hit the multi-year low in stock price. The Berkshire stock price at that time got down to about the 40000 and and it was literally that people were pulling money out of Berkshire Hathaway and putting it into Pets.com or Chemdex.com, all of these different kinds of euphoric e-toys and all of these things that were going on at the time. So he switched in the early 2000s from investing in growing pies to focusing on discounted pies because he thought the index would give him a lot of headwind and what traditionally growing pies were quite overheated. He did extremely well with discounted pies in the funds because the index in NASDAQ was flat from 2000 to 2016. It basically went nowhere. In fact, it went down quite a bit before it got back up to the same 2000 level and the S&P 500 was flat till about 2012. 
So they took a long time to get back to their previous highs. This ends part one of the three part series. So thank you very much for sticking with this video. Part number two, the five ways that you could get 10 to 100 X backers. So obviously the better way to invest between these two is growing pies, but you also need to keep in mind about where the market and the index is at, where you're not getting too euphoric. If you took this path to 10 to 100 baggers, the five ways you could get there is number one, focus mouse traps. These are very narrowly focused players with long runways. For example, Kiwi Chow Matai, McDonald's, Chipotle, and so on. Number two, great capital allocators. This would be companies like Berkshire Hathaway, Dana here, and Exor, which holds about 22% Ferrari. Number three, Uber Cannibals. They are very focused on stock buybacks and they end up buying back large portions of their own stock. This pie may not grow, but your share will. So for example, a company like NVR Inc., which is a US-based home builder from 1996 that started doing stock buybacks until 2020. They bought back around 80% of their outstanding shares. So this is just 18% of the shares outstanding. You can see NVR has delivered. In late December 2016, Pabrai and Ying Xiao co-wrote an article on Forbes.com that introduced the Uber Cannibals, a five-stock investing strategy that invested in businesses aggressively buying back their own stocks. In the last 20 years, it's gone up more than 55 times, and the business actually has not grown that much. All they've done is they've taken all of their free cash flow every year and invested it into buybacks. In recent years, Alibaba, Micron, and Apple have done the same. AutoZone is another one. These are not rapidly growing businesses, but again, similar story with investing in buybacks. Another one that happened in the 1960s and 1970s was Teledyne with Henry Singleton and George Kometsky. So Teledyne issued a lot of stock in the 1960s when it acquired almost 150 businesses, when the market gave it a very high multiple, and then in the 1970s when the U.S. equity markets were very cheap and collapsed, and Teledyne was trading at single-digit multiples of earnings, Henry Singleton bought back more than 80% of the stock, and again, in the case of Teledyne, they delivered about 125 times the value from 1960 to 1980. It was about 125x. Number four, deeply undervalued players or public leveraged buyouts or LBOs. This is when we take the turnarounds or leveraged businesses at bargain basement prices. For example, companies like Tech Common Co., Fiat Chrysler, and Rain Industries. Some companies like Tech Comico for Manish Pabrai became a 10 bagger. Fiat Chrysler in 2012 also did very well. Number five, spawners are companies that continuously spawned related and unrelated businesses. Examples of this would be Amazon, Alphabet, Alibaba, Tencent, or Baidu. Very few companies have the DNA to be great spawners. These are companies that have a deep conviction and really it's part of the DNA to keep adding and incubating new businesses that have the potential to be massive growth engines. They expect many of these things to fail and they take failure in stride and expect many failures. A good Bezos quote that exemplifies this is, staying in day one requires you to experiment patiently, accept failures, plant seeds, protect saplings, and double down when you see customer delight. These spawners use pre-tax earnings that make it very tax efficient and get free loans from the government on easy terms. Amazon is one of the great spawner companies that we have in the United States. Spawning also has a lot of advantages, in fact a lot more advantages than cannibals, because cannibals have to pay tax on their earnings and they can use the money to buy back shares. In the case of spawning, you're basically reducing your net income, which then reduces your taxes. So, in effect, you're getting an interest-free loan from the government on very easy terms. So, for example, through most of its history, Amazon has hardly reported much in earnings. Their core business, which are quite profitable, but 
they're taking all of the cash flows and continuously investing into new bets. 30 to 40% of the money they were investing would have gone to the government if they didn't do that. So it's a very capital efficient way to do this if you're good at spawning. This ends part two of the three part series. Part number three, the different spawner types. Manish Pabrai provides the definitions of different kinds of spawners. Number one, adjacent spawners are companies that create businesses that are close to the businesses they already have. Like Amazon, when they started, was only selling books, and then they started adding more categories. Like, they started selling music, and they kept adding more categories. So it didn't require a lot of change to the business. That's what he would call adjacent spawners. An example he gives is Starbucks. They've created a consumer packet good. The Frappuccino bottles, which first they did a deal with Pepsi, which sold in the supermarkets. They created the modern day coffee machine. In China, they have opened the Starbucks reserve stores, which have done really well, and they're also started experimenting with alcohol. Things like alcohol-infused drinks, which is quite a significant departure from what is traditionally a Starbucks store, but they're doing all of these spawns in and it extends the runway. Number two, embryonic spawners. These are companies that acquire businesses and then nurture them into larger enterprises. For example, Microsoft has not been an acquisitive company. It grew its business organically, but they bought what we know as PowerPoint. They actually bought the company Forethought Inc. and then they changed the name to PowerPoint and they made it part of the Office platform. This is what he calls embryonic spawner. Amazon has done a very good job with adjacent spawning and embryonic spawning like their purchase of Zappos and Whole Foods. Facebook has been really good at embryonic spawning where they bought Instagram and WhatsApp and Oculus. They have taken these embryonic businesses and they've created pretty significant value and growth. The same with what Google did with YouTube or what Google did with Android. Number three, cloner spawners. These are not innovative and they just copy successful products. Microsoft is in a good example of cloner spawners. The cloner spawned Windows from the Mac, Word and Excel from WordPerfect and Lotus, Explorer from Netscape, and Zoom from iPod, Azure from Google, and Amazon Web Services and Teams from Slate. Copying and not innovating is not a bad thing. Microsoft is a fantastic example of a cloner spawner and did a great job of copying Windows, Word, Excel, Explorer, Zoom, Azure, and Microsoft Teams. Number four, non-adjacent spawners. The non-adjacent spawners are created by new unrelated business areas. For example, recently during the lockdown, BYD went into manufacturing the KN95 masks, and that business has nothing to do with what you would consider the core competencies of BYD. But Wang Changfu, the CEO of the company, has never been limited by core competencies. He's repeatedly gone into businesses when you would look at him from the outside, and you would say he's got no competence in this, but he's repeatedly shown that he can get competence. So they entered the car business and they were able to make quite a success, which is extremely difficult. Keep in mind that some of these cloners didn't work. For example, for Amazon, they came up with the Fire Phone, but they couldn't get any traction. And then the Fire Phone was buried and they moved on. And then they've done non-adjacent spawning like Amazon Web Services, which was quite a departure from their typical retail. And it's done very well. Another example from Amazon is Kindle, which, again, was a departure from their core competency. Number five, Apex Spawner. This is a business which uses all four of these strategies. Manish Pabrai says that, in general, compared to the other spawner categories, Apex Spawners are very rare, and Apex Spawners can be amongst the very best investments you can make because they've got so many different ways to provide healthy rate of return. They are the Swiss army knife of spawners since they're good at all of the above. Apex spawners are very rare, and if you can spot an apex spawner early in its journey, it can be very attractive and can give you a pretty long runway because Amazon started with just a bookstore. It's like all eggs in one basket, and as they start doing more things because these are mostly digital bets, 
the return on capital is extremely high, and so it can also tolerate a lot of failure. He considers Apex Bonners to be Amazon, Alphabet, Alibaba Group, Berkshire Hathaway, Inc., Tencent, and Baidu. This ends part three of the three-part series. I do have a special bonus video called Prebrise Spawning Rules if you'd like to stick around. This is a bonus video after my three-part video series on the lecture. Without further ado, let's get started. Manish Prebrai says that most companies do not have the DNA to do spawning. Spawning is an unusual kind of DNA, especially the successful spawners. Since capitalism is very brutal and eventually all companies are going to die, it's just the nature of capitalism, even the strongest businesses, there will come a time when Alibaba will not be around, Amazon will not be around, because if you just study the history of businesses that were dominant 50 years ago, 100 years ago, they're not with us today. GE and IBM were good, strong spawners. If they had not done spawning, then they would have died a long time ago. So spawning extended the runway of these companies. Microsoft originally was just making compilers. They had a basic compiler, and then they went into becoming an operating system company. They actually bought the company called 86DOS or QDOS that became MS-DOS, and it would just be a failed company without spawning. Pabrai points out that in the United States, there were over 3,700 IPOs in the U.S. in the last 20 years. Only nine businesses with an IPO in the last 20 years have exceeded 100 billion market cap. Now, if you just make the simple assumption that a business that you invest in will never get more than the 50 billion market cap, if you just make that assumption, then by inversion, you get a couple of rules. So if you want a 10 bagger, that is 10 times your money out of the business, it means that you can't really buy a business which is more than $5 billion market cap. And if you want to buy a 100 bagger, then you really can't buy a business that is more than $500 million market cap. So if you look at any public company or most public companies around the world, almost all of them have been 100 baggers at some point. Most of the 100 baggers are usually captured while they were still private. So once they come public, they may not be small enough where you can get 100 times. So earlier you can get to these businesses, the more likely it is that you can get a 10 times your money or 100 times your money. So if we look at businesses like Alibaba today, it has a $462 billion market value. So can Alibaba be a 100 bagger in 20 years? It's probably unlikely because you're talking about $46 trillion. It's a really large number, and we don't even have businesses anywhere in the world that are more than $3 trillion. Catching multi-baggers early is important. But also, you have to remember that the earlier that you go into a company's life, the wider the range of outcomes. So if you invest in a multi-bagger today, the path is relatively narrow in terms of outcomes, but if you go into a very early stage business, the range can be quite wide. So there's an art and a science here in terms of making sure that you have enough traction. So in order to make sure he identifies these multi-baggers, he has what he calls Pabrai spawning rules. The first rule of the two Pabrai spawning rules is, number one, make an assumption that no business you invest in will ever exceed a $50 billion market cap. So if you want to make 10 times your money, you are going to buy below $5 billion market cap. If you want to make more than 100 times your money, you have to buy below $500 million market cap. The second rule is to look at the history of the business. So number two, look at the history of the business. Does it have a strong spawning DNA? Does it have a great capital allocator at the helm? No need to make historic assumptions. The future should be obvious from the past behavior of success or failure. What Manish Pabrai has found about spawning is that spawning is not a trait that you can easily screen for automatically. Yes, you can run a scheme for a low P&E. You can run a screen for low price to book. You can even run a screen for a lot of quantitative metrics about the company. 
It's generally not obvious what business is a spawner or is not a spawner until you spend at least a little bit of time looking at the business. Even a $500 million or $300 million business will have enough trademarks in the past. From the time that they were private and when they were public, which will make it obvious to us that this company has spawning DNA or doesn't have spawning DNA. The nature of the DNA, so that you can easily tell what's been going on in that business, of course, is to hunt on and find more of these spawners. So after you identify five or ten spawners, you just need to set it and forget it. There's a fantastic quote by Thomas Phelps, the author of the 100 to 1 in the stock market, that says, For an individual or institution really out to make a fortune in the stock market, it can be argued every sale is a confession of error. Thomas Phelps. So the hope is to never sell a stock once you've invested in it. The right way to think about it is that we want to become silent minority partners with Jack Ma or the Sam Walton or the Jeff Bezos. Manish Prabhai's friend, Nick Sleep, summoned it up in a quote and he said, The truly brilliant investors weren't investors. They were entrepreneurs that didn't sell. Nick Sleep. And when we have a portfolio of spawners, maybe five to ten spawners, you would do really well with just a couple of them hitting home runs. Of course, the question then comes up, when should you get off the bus? To quote Charlie Munger, who says, the first rule of compounding is to never interrupt. So Manish Prabhai suggests that we don't exit until it's absolutely clear that a secular decline has started. The business does not go up in a straight line, and there are going to be ups and downs. Ignore these temporary headwinds, and you have absolute clarity that the business is in a secular decline. You can exit, and even if you give up 50%, you sell at 50% from the peak because it would take a while for the market, and you figure out that there's a problem here. Every public company was or will be a 100 bagger. So there was a long runway there where we could have gotten on the bus for a long time. That's an unusual spawner. Companies like Uber are unlikely to deliver 100x post-IPO because it came public at $50 billion. So you would need to get a half a trillion, which might be difficult to do. Thank you very much for sticking through this summary of Manish Prabhai's lecture. Please like this video, and if you enjoy the information shared, comment and subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you once again, and I'll see you in the next video.